Welcome to another episode of Cold Emails and Hot Takes, where we talk cold email and cold outreach facts. Today, I have AJ on the podcast. Great to have you on the podcast, AJ. Thanks for having me, dude. Really excited to chat about this today. Okay, great. Yeah. For the viewers listening, AJ is the co-founder of Revenue Boost, a consulting company that teaches outbound lead generation, sales process, and how to build a sales team. And he's been able to partner up with top brands like Founder, AdWorld, and The Future. And fun fact, he actually started his entrepreneurial career by dropping out of college, going door to door selling construction services to build up a construction business before getting into the online space. So he knows a thing or two about cold outreach and closing uh, deals. Now, AJ, before this podcast, you mentioned a story where you were able to help someone add 30K monthly recurring revenue with cold email in just a few months. Can you tell me a little bit more about that story and how that developed? Yeah, awesome, man. So this is a great place to start. Actually, funny enough, this was our first client when we started the consulting side of our business at Revenue Boost. And it was just a smashing success. So it was like, <laughs> that usually never happens with your first client, but that was, um, that was really exciting. Um, yeah, this is, must have been about a year and a half ago. It was actually a digital marketing agency that just offered like every service under the sun. Um, and their issue was like their sales had been the same for like six months. So they weren't necessarily struggling. They were doing like 20, 30 K a month, but they just couldn't grow it. You know, like a lot of agencies, a lot of entrepreneurs in general, we start a business and we, we tap out all the warm sources, right? Like we, we exhaust our network, we exhaust our referrals. Um, so that was kind of that client's case where, yeah, ultimately, like she had gotten her business to a point, but then knew she needed to do cold email or something to kind of get to that next spot and be more proactive about it. Um, so we helped them with the whole campaign strategy, the copy and everything. Uh, the challenge with this campaign was that like, you know, there's a lot of digital marketing agencies out there. If you're offering SEO, web design, um, and Facebook ads, like you're one of like a million companies, right? Probably more. Um, so the, what really worked behind this campaign was really having a good uh, approach to the campaign. Um, and really lasering on a blue ocean niche. Uh, I can share the copy as well. I can, I probably even have it. I can pull it up and read it so you guys can see what the copy was. Um, but I think more than the copy was just the strategy because we analyzed all of our past clients. I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs watching this, they serve like a lot of different industries and stuff. Really helpful exercise to do this is look at your past clients. Look at the ones that were the easiest to sell to as far as they were the, the most receptive to your offer. And then also the easiest and the most profitable to deliver to. Um, because out of, out of all the different clients you might be working with, like they're not all the same. Some of them are definitely easier to work with. Some of them are definitely easier to sell to. Um, so we identified that like a really specific type of medical clinic was going to be the best bet for this campaign. Um, you know, it was like, it's like a, like a therapy clinic. So like mental and behavioral health was actually the niche. So like a really, really niche down, um, sector in the medical space. And we launched a campaign just for that. Um, so of course I'll share the copy, but the copy wasn't anything that fancy, uh, what really worked was just having a very good strategy and tapping into a niche that not many had tapped into. Um, because honestly, we were getting like six to 10 appointments a week, like right off the bat, which, you know, we weren't even, we must have been doing, I think, just 100, 125 emails a day. So it wasn't even anything like that crazy from a volume standpoint. Um, we just really like hit the right spot in the market. And I think, I'm glad you brought this up because I think um, it's a good lesson in this story because a lot of people, when they look to do any marketing, whether it's cold email, Facebook ads or whatever, they're always obsessing over the platform and the tactics. And that's like 10% of it. It's all of this stuff before, like what niche are we going after? What's the key message? You know, like what's the offer? It's like all these foundational things that we really got to talk about more because ultimately like the tools, the tactics, um, the marketing channels you use is an important consideration, but that's not going to make or break a campaign, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting. So to find that blue ocean niche, you basically just went back, looked at the best customers, and went after that, more, more of that. Is, is that that how approach and how you find that profitable segment or? Pretty much, yeah. So um, if you're a new brand new business, you know, like you'll have to just experiment and kind of find that along the way. But if you had customers and you're trying to niche down more, even just for the sake of a specific campaign, you don't need to change your whole business strategy. But I do think that like in my experience, the best outreach campaigns are the ones that are laser, laser specific because you can just really talk to that avatar very directly and catch their attention mm -hmm. more. Um, but yeah, we just looked at like two sides. So one fulfillment, right? Because obviously after you sell, you have to fulfill for the client. Um, so look at your past clients and just think like what, um, what's been the easiest to fulfill? What's been the least headaches, the most profitable? And also what's been the easiest to just market and sell to the least objections, that sort of things. Um, so yeah, just take stock of what you've already done and that you can kind of find the answers in there. 
Okay, nice. And then you basically went on and, and added like an additional 30K monthly recurring revenue from there. Yeah, it was insane. I mean, the business was, you know, sitting around 25K a month for like six months straight. And then within four months, they went to 50, 52K a month in revenue. Um, just from cold email, we didn't really do anything else. Okay, nice. Yeah, shows the power of like really segmenting, segmenting, niching down and, and being highly relevant with your messaging. Uh, that's a really, yeah. uh, really interesting uh, case study. Um, one thing that you mentioned to me is how to, besides getting client, clients from outbound, there's other things that you can get uh, with cold email. Uh, and you mentioned partnerships is like a big thing. Can you tell me a little bit more about like how to set up partnerships with uh, cold email and, and outbound? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think, you know, the, the reason I just absolutely love outreach and just the concept of like direct lead generation is because you can use it for so many things in your business. Obviously, you, you can use it to uh, get clients, um, but we've used it to land speaking gigs, um, podcasts to help grow our brand. Um, and partnerships as well. So you can use your outbound to help you in other areas of the business. Um, and partnerships can be a lot of different things. I mean, if you're like an agency um, and you offer a specific service like SEO to a specific niche, find other agencies that don't offer SEO, but they offer other things. And you could just establish a base of like five to 10 referral partnerships um, of people that are serving the same industry as you, but not you know competitive, so to speak. Just email them. This would be a way easier sell than trying to book a consultation call because you're not really selling anything. You're finding like a just a really win-win partnership. Um, and then you can do this with, with any niche. It's like even if you have a SaaS tool, find other SaaS tools or other service providers that serve your niche in a non-competitive way. And you can set up referral partnerships as well. Um, this is an easy win. When you're using cold email for stuff other than client acquisition, it's best to not um, use like a, like a very templated approach. You should definitely personalize that message um, cause it's a small, small pool of people, but one way would be having referral partnerships. Um, if you do any like JVs in your business, like partner with other content creators to get in front of their audience, that's another thing. So you could hit up someone that has an email list, hit up someone that has a Facebook group, hit up someone that has a podcast, um, and see about getting in front of their audience. I mean, actually when we launched the revenue boost brand uh, a year and a half ago or so, I got on the Futures YouTube channel, uh, Christo, some of you guys might know him. He has like 2 million subscribers. And um, I just sent him a cold email. Like people always ask me, how did you get on Christo's show? And I just sent him a cold email. Um, now, you know, more often I get invited on shows and stuff because we've really built the brand. But at the beginning, I just sent a cold email. And I think at that point, we literally had zero followers on our social media, right? Like it was a brand new company. I think most people in my shoes would be maybe like too intimidated to reach out to a high influencer right from the bat. Um, but really like if you could just get like out of, out of that, maybe mindset hurdle and just go, just reach up, like go bigger, you know, you'll be surprised when people would say yes. I mean, you're a content creator as well, dude, you know, like you're always looking for new ideas and new guests on the show. Right. Cause it makes, it makes your life easier as well. Right. Yeah. Um, so most content creators that have audiences are very much more open than you think to having a guest on the show. And don't worry if you don't have like a huge social media following, or if you're not like a, an author or keynote speaker, like you just have to make sure that you can show that you're credible in what you do and you have unique value um, to offer their show. And this is why, you know, for that, you really want to personalize the messaging because like in that case, when I reached out to um, that influencer, I, you know, talked about his YouTube channel. I talked about a certain topic he wasn't covering that would be really, really valuable to his audience and why. And I said, that's the topic that I'm the expert in, which was, you know, B2B lead gen. Um, and I just asked, like, I didn't ask if I could be on your show. I was like, can I send you a five minute video explaining my idea for the, for the collaboration? And he was like, sure, send it. And then I sent him a video talking more about myself and talking more about the episode. And then he was like, let's do it. And I got in front of basically, I mean, we got like 40,000 views in a, a week's time or so. Um, nice. we had just, we had just launched our Facebook group because that was, this was just when we launched the company and our Facebook group got another 800 members in like a week. So it was crazy. Like, you know, that's the way to hack, you know, content creation and like organic growth. Like we all know that building an audience takes time, but if you can use outbound to get in front of other people's audiences, then that's a way to like shortcut the process. Mm, yeah. That's a great angle to, uh, to go at it. So basically the structure of the cold email that you sent to the podcast with 2 million subscribers, it was like, it was personalized. You mentioned personalized, like yeah. a gap or like something that, that may be missing from, from the content. And then like yeah. just a, a simple com, uh, call to action where you where you offered them to lay out the strategy in a, a five-minute video. Is that how Pretty you much. 
Pretty much, yeah. So it's funny if you think about it, it's the same kind of framework for like if you were to send to a client, right? Like personalized part, start with the problem before you go into your solution and then go for like a, a soft ask, right? So it's really the same principles of like outreach to for lead gen and clients. Um, but yeah, that was pretty much it. I'd say the only other difference is like I talked a little bit more, like I went deeper on the personalization because it was a you know much bigger, harder to reach person. Um, so I really talked about like how much I love to show I've been following it for a while and then like really laid out like the problem I saw with this channel and what was missing. Um, so yeah, I mean, normally like the higher value of a prospect you're going after for anything, the more it's like worth it to put that extra effort in for the personalization, you know? Yeah, yeah definitely. And how did you find the email address of that particular, um, uh, podcast? Like if, if someone wants to do the same thing and, and they know about a, a popular podcast, where do we find the email addresses of that person? Um, yeah, funny enough, man, this was really before I like learned what all the best databases were. So I literally just guessed and I just typed in like his first name at the company and it, show, it shows up. Okay. If you do that with anyone on Gmail, it'll show up. Um, so also like if you can't find someone's email, like an influencer's email in like Apollo or whatever, um, just try typing in their name with their company in your Gmail and uh, like their headshot would show up if it's the right one. Um, okay, nice. That's, that's yeah, a neat, so little, like... neat little trick right there. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, so you mentioned, you touched on it a little bit where you said, okay, how can you use outbound and inbound strategy, working them together to achieve hyper fast growth? How, how do you go about that combining these two uh, things? Yeah, really awesome question. I think they can work really well together. I think a lot of people look at outbound and inbound as separate because obviously they are separate things, but they should be, I mean, all of the marketing in your company should work together and kind of benefit off each other, right? Um, so when we launched Revenue Boost, you know, the same way I've launched any of my previous businesses, it was just straight outbound just to get that fast like validation before doing anything crazy. Um, but, you know, when you're doing like only outbound, it can be a lot of a grind, right? So eventually you'll get into other stuff. Um, so we started with just outbound and then we launched inbound, which for us was the Facebook community. And for us, it was me growing a LinkedIn following. Um, but then over the time, as the audience on the, both of those places started to grow, I realized like, hey, if we have an audience on social media, if you have some kind of inbound presence, like only a small percentage of people are seeing your posts and only a small percentage of people are reaching out to you, right? Like most people with their, with their content creation and social media, they just wait for people to like become a lead, but only a small percentage of people are like actually going to take the effort to become a lead. It's only people that are like really, really interested, which is great, but there's still a whole big portion of your audience that trusts you, but just hasn't necessarily raised their hand yet to do something. So what we did was at first I was just DMing every single follower and every single group member. Um, so just like really like hand-to-hand -hand combat guerrilla marketing, <laughs> chatting with them, seeing what posts of mine they liked, seeing what they needed, what their business was about, and if we could help them. Um, then later we hired an appointment center to take that over and just basically talk to like every person in our group, every person that follows me, um, every person that comments on certain posts, um, things like that. So yeah, first you can start to build your following and then you can create a process to DM followers. Um, then you can also have a, you know, strategic content process where like, you know, you post a CTA post once in a while, or you post a lead magnet. Um, like you've probably seen that people post on Facebook, like, Hey, I just created this free thing, comment this word if you want it. Right. Um, and then you can have certain posts that are meant to get a lot of comments and then DM all the people that comment on it. Cause then, you know, it's like, not just anybody, it's actually like a warm lead because they have shown some interest in what you do already. Um, so that's one way. So at the very minimum, like get your outbound up, you know, use instantly. It's absolutely the best tool out there. Um, you don't, don't need to look any further for that. Once you get your outbound sorted, then start building your social media presence. Um, Cause once we got both those together, like things really exploded for us. And once your social media presence is off the ground, then you can just create a process for like reaching out to your followers and reaching out to people that comment on certain posts. Um, and then along the way, you can use outbound to grow your social media by doing what we talked about before, which is, um, building relationships with influencers and trying to get in front of uh, other people's audiences. No, for sure. Like, you know, cold and like outbound and like content strategy, they're like not mutually exclusive, right? You don't have to pick yeah. which one you want to do. You can just do both. And then it's very synergistic. You you can, like you said, yeah, you can achieve a really fast growth like you've been doing. Yeah, for with, sure, man. They all can work together. Yeah. With cold email, like this is a little bit of a broad question, but with cold email, how do you get more positive replies? Yeah, I think first, uh, the biggest thing is figuring out how you're going to be different and pattern interrupts. So like almost every cold email I get, it's like, hey, Jay, I'm this person. I work at this company. We're the leading blah, 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 blah. 
uh, and we have these services. Would you like a 30 minute meeting? So like everyone says that, that template is only really going to work if it's in a niche that isn't hit up or prospected very often, right? Um, so like, I think in order to get more replies, I think it's really about understanding like the marketing principles first, you know? So kind of like I talked about before about, um, you know, how we can't just be looking at like the tools and the tricks, but we have to really just understand marketing principles in general. Um, one of those marketing principles is knowing the sophistication of your market. So if your market is more inundated with pitches and they're more like you're more in a competitive or saturated niche, you have to adjust your approach. You have to know what other people are doing so that you can be different. And whatever that is, whether it's a, a creative offer or creative copy or just some way to like break the pattern, you know, because then people actually read. If you're in a very like, you know, new market and the people you're reaching out to, they're not getting prospected very often, you can go with a really simple like offer based email and it's going to work a lot more. Um, but you have to like, like this is the problem sometimes when we just take templates off the internet, we have to like really assess our market and make our messaging strategy based towards that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes a lot of um, sense. Yeah, I would, I would say that, so that's one principle. Another principle is just knowing like um, um, the, the buyer's journey. So the problem awareness and solution awareness, you know, by Eugene Schwartz. So like people have to be aware of the problem before they have to be aware of the solution. So we almost all the time, like talk about the problem first before we really say like what we do. Um, so like having most of your copy be about them, the other person, their problems and results they might want. You don't really need to even need to mention your service like at all. Just mention that you have a solution to their problem. Um, so yeah, I think it's these marketing fundamentals, dude. Like, you know, I was talking to someone the other day who was uh, wanting some help with their business and they were like, I've tried Facebook ads, I've tried LinkedIn, I've tried Google. He mentioned like everything. He's like, nothing worked. And I was like, okay, well, the common, denominator, the common denominator between all of those things is your marketing skills and your message, right? So you need to fix that and not try another, you know, 14th platform, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's just getting really honing the copywriting skills and also the market research, like understanding your market. This is why niching down is key because you can speed up the process of getting to know your market. Um, but yeah, I think if everyone wants to get more replies with their cold email or just any outrage, it's just really aiming to be the best copywriter you can be through practice and learning and really getting to know your market well. Um, because yeah, just getting better at those skills will make all of your, all of your stuff work better. You know, th this is why like if you've, if you've ever taken a template and just plug it into a campaign without really customizing it and it didn't work, something could work for someone else, but not for you. That's why you have to, you have to have the skills yourself um, and, and really try to understand marketing. That way you can know like why something works or why it doesn't. So you can put your own spin on it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How can people go about like understanding their market better? Like, you know, having that understanding so they can write compelling copy, like how do they get that information? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so we have, a, we have a couple of different ways we suggest doing that. I've, um, I mean, the best thing you can do is actually talk to customers. So like if you're already doing sales calls, if you're already, assuming that you're already like in your niche and you're trying to understand it better, the most valuable thing, the most valuable research is like what's coming out of your prospect's mouth, right? Um, like what you're, like think back to your sales calls as far as like, what are people telling me they jumped on the call for? Like, why did they, why are they even interested in my service in the first place? And what is the reason they didn't buy? Like, what are the objections or what are the past experiences they've had that were negative that caused them to not buy? So like, if you don't record your sales calls, I'd recommend that because you can literally find the best market research in there. Um, but I would say just first have a think back to your previous prospect conversations, whether it's through social or on calls, just think back to like the common trends, like, the problems they had, how they describe those problems, because you want to describe the problem in their language, not yours, right? Because you're trying to really, you know, see what's going on in their mind. Uh, just think back to all the patterns and like the objections you've got and all those sorts of things. And you'll, you'll start to really see like the trends. Um, if you're a new business or you're tapping into a new niche and you don't really have like a lot of previous conversations or sales calls to reflect on, then you can either just hang out on communities online, like Reddit, Facebook groups or forums or whatever and just see like where these people talk and you'll start to see like some common things or you could even go out and do customer interviews. Um, one of our consulting clients right now is launching a new product and before even launching outreach campaigns, he's launching email campaigns just to get people on a 15 minute research call to really under ask them questions so he can understand more about the market, A, to write better copy, but B, to write, to, to create a better product for them, right? Cause he's in like the product development phase. So. Another way you can use cold email is just do like, you know, customer interviews or research calls. Um, but yeah, lots of things you can do, but ultimately the best thing is just actually talking to people because then you can really like 
really see how they explain things, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Like sur surveys and stuff are great, but like the one-on-one -on -one conversations is really where you, you get to understand like, okay, who your customer actually is, what, they, what they're battling with and, and so on. Um, Dude, totally, man. Yeah, there's, there's no way, nothing better than that for sure. And a lot of people are probably sitting on gold. A lot of people, they just probably do their sales calls and then just like forget about it after, but like really think back to those because there's a lot of gold and mar there's a lot of gold market research just sitting in front of you in those calls. Like, honestly, if you're getting a lot of objections, you should almost be happy because it's like, okay, this objection is feedback for me to improve my offer or improve my sales pitch or improve my copy or whatever. So like mm -hmm. whenever you're getting someone that doesn't buy from you in a sales call, that's actually can be looked at as a positive thing because that gives you the answers that you need to optimize like whatever you're doing, your copy or just your general understanding of the market, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, good point. Um, so I know you know a lot about outbound, but you're also are really an expert with like appointment setting and, and closing. So my question would be, once you have that positive reply, like that interest in your inbox, in the uni box or wherever it may be, how do you turn that interest into a booked meeting? And how do you make sure they also show up for the meeting? What, what's that process look like? Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought that up. It's definitely an important thing because positive replies are awesome, but that's just that's just the first step. That's like the first mini sale, right? Okay. <laughs> um, so first I'd say, you know, one thing I've learned about sales is that time kills deals. Like, you know, you have to just be as speedy as possible with responding to leads. Um, it makes the biggest difference. Like I had someone, you know, we had a big hurricane here in Vietnam a week ago. So I, I had a discovery call with the prospect. Absolutely great call. We really vibed well and really saw a great fit to work together. We had another call a few days later, but then my power went out because of the storm. So I'm like, hey, dude, let's talk next week because I have, I have no power. There's like a typhoon. And he's like, okay, cool. On Monday, he's like, hey, man, sorry, but I ended up buying another program. And I was like, shit. So um, like that can happen a lot in sales. You can lose deals just because the time is too long. And like, if people are looking to solve their problem, they're not usually just looking at your company, right? Um, there's that. And then there's also the fact that like people just lose their interest, right? If they have see a new thing in your cold email, they're like, oh, that's cool. But if they don't like convert right away, they, they just get busy with other things. So first things first is really optimize the speed to lead. Meaning like make sure like every day, first thing you're checking for new positive replies and getting to those ASAP. Um, second thing would be making sure you have a follow-up procedure. So don't just like randomly follow, but have like a, like a, like a procedure you follow every time. Um, for me, I usually will just do like a once a week email to someone if they haven't booked yet. I don't want to be too like uh, pushy or anything, but usually just like a once a week email and it's kind of like templated out. Hey, did you get a chance to find a time? Um, let me know if you need you know, me to open up some more times or something like that. Um, and then I might also prospect them on another channel as well, like reach out to them on LinkedIn or Facebook if, you know, they went ghosted on email. Um, but basically, like, know that you're going to have to follow up with positive replies because some people, they just need that extra push and just have like a, you know, step-by-step -step plan for it so that you can just follow the same thing once a week. Um, that's follow up. But I think mostly as far as getting show rates, I mean, I think the biggest thing is just really how you're framing, like the value they get out of the call. Um so a lot of companies, they get like 60, 70% of appointments to show up. If that even, some even get less. We get usually 90 to 100% to show up on the discovery call. Like in uh, in uh, November, was it September, we had literally every single person show up to their call, which was which is awesome. Um, oh, nice. so, so I look back to see like, why did that happen? And I analyzed a few things. Part of it is the follow-up for sure. But part of it is just like, if someone doesn't show up to a call or an appointment, um, it's like they just didn't see value in it. Or if they don't answer your cold email reply after you, they've shown interest and they don't book a call, it's like they just didn't see value. So it's really important to not just say like, hey, let's hop on a meeting or hey, let's hop on a consultation call. There's nothing sexy about a consultation call, right? Um, it's like we've all, we've all heard that. So try, like, try to show that there's some value they get out of the call, even if they don't work with you. I'm going to actually give them value too. Like we always make sure that everyone that speaks to us gets something useful out of the discovery call, even if they don't hire us, you know? So um, yeah, I think framing the call as something valuable is really important. Um, and I mean, you can even entice them further saying like, Hey, I'll give you this free resource after the call or something like that. Um, but yeah, show them that there's tangible value in the call, regardless of if they work with you. And also you just have to really solve an urgent pain. So like if people aren't showing up to the call um, very often, like let's say you've optimized your follow-up, you're sending reminders, um, all those sorts of things, and you're still not getting good show rates, it might be because your offer isn't solving an important pain and you need to like change your offer or change the niche or like change the messaging. Um, because again, like if people aren't showing up to a call, um, 
the main reason is they just didn't value it. They just didn't see it as that important to them, right? So showing value in the call, but also making sure that whatever you're offering them in the first place, like that's actually solving an important and, you know, relevant pain for them. Because if it's just like some small thing, you know, like, hey, we have a new tool to help you improve your reply rates by 0.5%. It's like people might be like, oh, that's cool. I'll check it out. But they're, if something more important comes up that day, they're going to cancel you, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then once they are on that call, once they show up for the meeting, how do you close? How do you close high ticket from there? Yeah. So I think um, first it's really about like, you know, reframing kind of what sales is. So a lot of people think that sales is all about like, I got to have the perfect pitch and the perfect presentation. And I got to talk a lot and say all these like really, you know, well said things about our products. Um, but for me, I've learned it's about like fit, flipping the script. And like people don't like prospects don't really care that much about like you and your company. Of course, they, they still want to know about you and your company and build a relationship, but they care about more about themselves than anything. Right. So we have to we have to understand that we're walking into, you know, a strategy call or something. So keep the most of the focus on the call around them. Uh, it should be like 70 to 80 percent discovery and then like 20 to 30 percent presenting your solution. Um, so most of the calls should be like, what are you doing? What's your business? What are your biggest problems? What are those problems causing? in your business as far as like a bigger consequence, you know, what are your goals after you solve these problems? And then once you know all those things, you have this like, you, you can see like their picture, right? Um, and then you use that to present your offer very effectively. Because if I know like someone's current situation, the main problems that they're having and um, the things that they want to solve and what they're ultimately trying to achieve, then you can just frame your offer as like the solution to help them get over their problems and achieve their goals. Um, so basically, like every time you present your offer, it should be tailored a little bit. Like it should be a little bit different the way you explain it, because it should just be talking about the stuff that actually matters to that person based on what they told you in the discovery phase. So really, like the sale is really one in discovery. It's not about like having the perfect demo or pitch, because most people, they're not even listening half the time when you're showing them your, your solution. Um, so it's more about like just caring about them, just putting the focus on them, just really trying to understand them and see how you can help them. And if you do that for most of the call, they're going to really feel like connected to you. Like, wow, this person actually, you know, gives a crap um, and, uh, you know, actually wants to help me. And then from there, not only do you build a lot of rapport through discovery, but you understand what matters the most to them. So you can just talk about that. Like, for example, you know, for our Revenue Boost uh, consulting program, there's a lot of different ways that we help entrepreneurs inside of it. And the mistake I made in the beginning was I would talk about all the different things we could teach someone to grow their business and get more leads and get more appointments. And like some of it would turn them off because they'd be like, oh, I don't need that. I don't want to pay for that part. Can we take that out? And it would just become this whole like thing. So now it's like, I really just try to talk about, you know, whatever problems they mention, whatever goals they have, just how specific parts of our offer will help them with those things, you know? And it's the same. I mean, if I was like working for a SaaS company and selling SaaS, I would do the same thing. I would look at all the features we have. And I would do discovery to see like which features we had that would matter the most to that person. And then just talk about those, you know? Um, so yeah, I guess to summarize, it's more about flipping the script and realizing that sales isn't about having the most perfect pitch. It's about really understanding your customer, getting good at discovery, having like a framework to follow as well. Um, and having your demo, having your solution be a little bit tailored to that person. Okay. Great points. And let's say an agency owner or like anyone with a B2B offer is listening to this and they're currently the main person doing the sales and the sales calls, how can they build a sales team to help them so they can remove them, uh, remove themselves a little bit more from that process? How can they build that team of closers around them? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I'd say first is don't try to do it too early. A lot of times I see an agency owner or any like entrepreneur that's doing like 5,000 a month or 10,000 a month. And they're like, struggling with sales. So they think the solution is to outsource it and to go like build a team of commission only closers and setters, which sounds like a dream because it is like, you're not gonna be able to build a whole commission only team when you haven't even gotten your business off the ground, you know? Um, so realize that like first step is making sure you're ready to build a sales team. Um, and that should be after you figured it out yourself. So you shouldn't be bringing in salespeople to fix a broken sales process. You should be bringing in salespeople to accelerate a working sales process when you just need the time back, right? Because if you try to outsource too early, you try to go hire VAs or closers before you've even like figured out sales yourself, then you're bringing them into a broken system. You're not setting them up for success. They're not going to make money because they're not like they're paid on commission, right? Um, and it's just going to be a, a disaster. So you want to like 
I, th I think this goes for most positions in a business as far as hiring employees is we want to like figure out that box that they live in. We want to like figure out the process they could follow before they come in. So before bringing any employee into a business, it's best to know like what is that process they're going to follow um, and does that process work? So basically the advice here is figure out how to set appointments and generate leads yourself before hiring a setter. When you can at least get like five appointments a week, okay, you've at least created a process that works consistently. Now you can look at getting time back with the setter. And when you're at least closing like 20% of your deals and you know that you can bring clients in and onboard them every month, okay, now that you know you have a process that works, now you can bring in a closer. Um, but you have to really go through the grind of like getting good at it yourself and establishing that process. Um, that way, when you bring people in, it'll actually work because then you don't need to find like the world's best closer. You just need to find anybody who's like decent and can follow your process. Mm -hmm. okay, um, great. Yeah. And, and when you're ready to do it, as far as how to, like you asked, it's really just figuring out usually the first um, hire is like an appointment setter and then it would be a closer. Um, sometimes you could hire someone that's like both roles. So a lot of companies do it different ways, but first just figure out like what's eating up the most of your time. Usually a lead generation and appointment setting is the more like tedious stuff that you could outsource easier. Um, and then once that's getting like 10, 20 appointments a week, then you can look at getting a closer and having enough work for him. So I would usually, at least what we've done is always like the appointment setter role first and then the closer role second. Okay, gotcha. And those appointment setter and closer roles, uh, do you always do them a commission only? And, and if yes, where do you find the, the commission only people? Yeah, we usually do um, a base, uh, like a small base. You could do like, you know, 500 to 2000 bucks a month for a full-time person, assuming that mm -hmm. you have a good commission plan for them for appointment setters. Um, Closures, you know, you can do commission only. It's fine because if you're if you're hiring a closer that you're already going to have warm leads on their calendar, then they can make money in the first two weeks, right? So, yeah. um, we've given base to closures before. I'm not I'm not against it, but I think it's it's more common at least the online space just to do commission only, assuming that you set up calls for them. Um, yeah, yeah. For you that need to a work calendar like, for that. Yeah, you need to make sure. Yeah. They have a, a good calendar, and it's full. Yeah, totally, man. Because if you um again like. I look at all of our sales team as my goal is to help them make as much money as possible. I'm more concerned with the sales team making commissions than I am with like what our company makes. Cause I know that if they're making good money, then everything else will work out. Um, but you have to realize if someone's coming into your company and they're on commission only, or they're on like a low base plus commission, they need to be able to make money in the first two months. Right. So that's why you have to be set up well so that they actually hit their goals and they want to stick with you long-term, you know? Okay, great. Yeah, so AJ, as, as a last question here, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the future on where cold outreach is going. What can people do today to prepare and stay ahead of the curve? Yeah, man, I think it ties back to what we talked about before, which is just like getting really good at the principles of marketing and sales as well. If you can do that, no matter what's happening in the world, whether there's an alien invasion or if Elon Musk takes us all to Mars, like you'll always be able to generate leads and grow a business if you know the fundamentals and the principles, right? Which just comes down to doing it and studying, reading books, learning from mentors, things like that. Um, because the tools will change. We can't know like what, you know, Google updates gonna happen next year or what's gonna happen with Gmail or what's gonna happen with Facebook or anything. So like the technology will always need to be adapted to, but the principles of marketing, like understanding your market, you know, having a really good uh, core message for your outreach, right? Like those types of things, um, those won't change because those are just based on like human psychology. So I would say if you just keep focusing on getting good at the fundamentals of marketing and sales and keep practicing your skills, you'll always be in a in good shape regardless of what happens. Yeah, yeah, for sure. If you master the fundamentals, then, then you're always going to be able to eat. Yeah, exactly, man. Well, let me fire that back out to you. What, what do you think is going to happen in the cold email or just marketing world in the next five, 10 years? Like, what do you see as coming up? Uh, next five, 10 years, a little bit difficult uh, to predict, but I think uh, it's more of a, of a, let's say the next six to 12 months, I'd say it's more of a yeah. very creating highly relevant cold emails, like yeah. getting data that is this timely. For example, something just happened recently. you get a lead list yeah. of CTOs or a lead list of CEOs who have just recently switched positions or that are currently hiring for certain positions. So just, just that just in time message, that relevant message, yeah. um, that's going to be super important. Just, you know, you're going to get more replies and it's more relevant and uh, it resonates much better if you're addressing something that they're currently doing. 
uh, and you know what you're doing, right? If you're scraping a job post that they where they're hiring SDRs, you know they're looking for lead gen help. And if you send them an, an a cold email about lead gen, they're probably going to be receptive uh, for that. So I think just you know having the good timing based on good data sources uh, is where it's yeah. going. For sure, man. And what makes you say that is just because you see like a lot more people are doing cold email and we need more ways to stand out or like what's the, the thought process there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I've been talking to some people. Um, uh, Eric is, is one of them and he, he really has some good examples on, on sending those timely, uh, timely uh, cold emails. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. So overall, man, we all just got to get better, right? The competition is yeah. only get, going to get bigger. So it's just a matter of getting better and more, more creative, right? Exactly. Yeah, AJ. So it was really great to have you on the podcast. You dropped a lot of value. Um, I'm going to rewatch this uh, once we upload it to the YouTube channel. And uh, so where can people go to uh, learn more uh, from you or about you and uh, any of the strategies that you shared? Uh, maybe some more details. Yeah, sure. So I would say um, you can join our Facebook community, B2B Sales and Marketing Secrets. Um, that's the place where I share like the most content and we have a lot of cool interviews and stuff in there too. And we have a mini course on, um, B2B lead gen and sales as well. So a lot of that sales, uh, strategy we talked about before. Um, so yeah, join the Facebook group. We have a lot of cool stuff in there. I'm pretty active in there too, to, to chat with. Uh, and then also I'm pretty active on LinkedIn at AJ Casada if you want to, uh, link up there. But yeah, okay, dude, thanks great. for having me, man. It's been a, been a pleasure. Yeah, it was good. Great to have you on. And, and for the listeners, I'll include the links, uh, in the description so just go check out aj and the community and the mini course and uh yeah so thanks again for your time and uh, aj i'll talk to you soon and uh, for the listeners uh if you like this interview like and subscribe and uh talk soon thank you you got it see ya see ya